I'm Elliot Sigwin. This is the flight video for Flight 7 of Bowers Pony. So the plan for Flight 7 had been to continue to expand what we had learned on Flight 6 about the longitudinal handling of the airplane. Rod had redone the weight and balance based on question marks we had on Flight 6, and the plan was to fly several different configurations on Flight 7, weighing the airplane in between to be confident we had the exact weight and balance for each flight. Unfortunately, not as many people were there as we had hoped, and we weren't confident we could get the airplane on and off the scales with just the three of us. So we ended up uh, scrubbing that plan and instead spent the day working on landing procedures, both normal and emergency. Clear. On every previous flight before this one, we'd only landed the airplane one time. The first two or three flights had been uh, forced landings where we were dealing with an emergency, and then after that we'd moved to a sort of normal landing approach based on what was said in the manual. The purpose of this flight was to validate that that was in, in fact the best way to land the airplane. I used a overhead approach where I would show up over the airport at 1500 feet AGL and 200 miles per hour to downwind a beam where I would be configured with full flaps and gear at gear speed 130 miles per hour. Then I would fly 115 on base, final at 100, and then finally touch down at 90 miles an hour. This ended up working out real well and I was happy with that overall landing procedure. My only concern was the initial decel from 1500 feet and 200 miles per hour to 1000 feet and 130 miles an hour gear speed was a bit tight. So you ended up having to really hurry to get the power out and be diligent about getting on that new speed or you'd end up too fast to swing the gear and you'd end up blowing the downwind leg out and, and end up with a really long final. A long final of course is a challenge in this airplane because it takes a lot of power once you get the airplane configured with gear and flaps uh, to hold altitude, to hold that glide slope. And so if you're longer, if you're further out on final, that's more time that you're relying on the power to stay alive. Angular 1 to clear the active three zero advice ahead. Taxi back for another go. After doing a couple normal landings, I went on to the emergency landing profile. We've flown emergency, actual emergency landings in this airplane now a couple times, and I had some gut feel for what the airplane was going to like. The challenge with this point was not, not necessarily just to focus on getting the airplane safely on the ground, which had been the case on flight one and two when we had actual emergencies, but in this case, flying something quantifiable enough that we could one day document it in a manual and pass it on to other operators of the airplane. The problem with an airplane like this with such significant drag in landing configuration is you don't have enough energy to do the round out and safely touch down. So you have two problems. First, the airplane has a significant descent rate, which needs to be arrested. Of course, arresting that takes G, and you can only make G if you have CL margin or if you are above stall speed. 
The second problem is if the airplane is very nose low, then you have to change the pitch attitude of the airplane such that you don't hit the propeller on touchdown. Both of those things take energy, and the only way to store energy is with velocity. So the mass of the airplane traveling at a velocity is the kinetic energy, and that's what you're trading in order to make that G and do the round out. A good rule of thumb for an airplane like this is you're probably gonna want as much energy as you can get. So therefore, I always start by flying the emergency approach at gear speed. So you've literally stored as much energy as possible kinetically. Then it all comes down to the flare. You have one chance to go from uh, significant rate of descent and significant nose low attitude to pulling the nose up, making the G, stopping the descent, and smoothly touching down. If you round out too early, you don't have enough energy to accelerate and then reflare. And if you round out too late, you're still turning the corner when the ground shows up. Surprisingly, this is a skill set that is also common in ultralights. An ultralight has the same problem where it's high drag, and the kinetic energy problem is made worse by the fact that it has no weight. So the fact that it can't actually store kinetic energy because it has no weight means that you have the same problem, where you end up with huge descent rates and you don't have enough energy to flare. So for my first attempt at this simulation, emergency landing, I showed up over the airport at 6,000 feet AGL and 180 miles per hour. Then on my way to low key, I slowed down to gear speed, got the gear and the flaps out, and then into final. For that first attempt, I also used full RPM, so full 4,200 RPM or takeoff RPM. It ended up that 6,000 6, feet was too high. I actually had too much energy and I could tell that by the time I got to low key and knocked the whole thing off powered up, climbed back up to 5,000 feet this time, also at 180 miles an hour, and did the same setup. So 180 miles an hour, 5,000 feet, 30 degrees bank, round a low key, gear and flaps, full RPM the whole time, and took it in towards the ground. This time, I wasn't confident and didn't want to make this simulated emergency into an actual emergency, so I powered up and went around. On that third attempt, I actually ended up taking it all the way to the ground, but I ended up having to squirt just a little bit of power on it on short final. After that third attempt on taxi back, I decided that I didn't yet know enough about the overall drag characteristics of the airplane to be doing this part of the program and decided that I would climb up to altitude and just do a quick survey of what the overall drag situation of the airplane was. So in order to get just a quick look at the drag situation, I started out by at 14,500 feet with the airplane in clean configuration and 3,000 RPM. And I took three points, first 130, then 115, and then 100 miles per hour. Those three speeds I thought best simulated the center of the emergency landing envelope. Using the VSI on the EFIS, I could quickly get a hack at what the, the vertical speed of the airplane was without taking the time to time the airplane between altitude. So our first configuration was clean at 3000 RPM. And I like to think of this as sort of the baseline drag for the airplane this top line being the lowest drag and every line below it being ad adding a system. You can see that hump in the center that you remember from your primary instruction correlating to lowest drag or VY or best glide. For the next configuration we just turn the prop up from the 3000 RPM we saw on the previous configuration up to 4200 RPM or takeoff RPM. For that you can see down here the there's a big increase in drag so the rate of descent goes up significantly. But you can also see that the rate of descent goes up even more as we throw the gear out. So the difference between that orange line and the red line being the extension of the gear. What's interesting about that is being parasitic, it goes up significantly with an increase in airspeed. So this gap gets bigger or the effect of the gear gets bigger as the indicated airspeed goes up. And then finally this bottom line is the gear and flaps at 4,200 RPM. What's not shown here is that the deck angle in this configuration was 20 degrees below the horizon. Back to the top here we have the base configuration of the airplane then we add the propeller which is this first gap. This little gap here is the gear and then finally the bottom line is the all the added drag of the flaps. Which leads to our final chart which has indicated airspeed on the bottom and engine RPM on the left. What we're showing here is that regardless of whether or not you've commanded takeoff RPM, if below 130 knots, there's just not enough indicated airspeed to turn the prop that fast. So if you look here at 130, we're turning the 4200 RPM or the commanded engine RPM. But as the airspeed decays down to 115 miles an hour, there's only enough 
air to blow it at 3200 RPM. And then at 100 miles per hour, you can see it's 3000 RPM. So back to our first plot, you can see these huge increase in drag as we turn the engine RPM up to 42. What's important about this is that it's all going back to that baseline drag as the airspeed gets down to 100 miles per hour indicated because there's just not enough air to blow the propeller at that 4200 RPM and therefore there's not enough air to make the drag required to see this huge delta that we're seeing on the right side of the plot. So the two most interesting things we learned from that quick drag survey was one, the propeller is just as big of a contributor as we thought it was. However, you need airspeed in order to get the propeller to spin fast enough to have it create the drag that it's capable of. The second thing that we learned was that the flaps, while they added some drag, their biggest contributor was to lower the nose. We were doing, trying to do two things in the flare. First, stop the vertical speed, and second, orient the airplane such that it can touch down. If the nose is really low, that's there's more work therefore that needs to be done. Not to mention the emotional side effect of being a pilot looking at that much pavement. And then for the fourth and final simulated emergency landing of the day, we flew 5,000 feet high key at 160 miles per hour to 130 with gear extension, no flaps, touchdown at 90 miles per hour like we had before. So of all the flights that we've done, Flight 7 was probably the most fun for me. It was fun to have such a steep learning curve where we took off with one view of the airplane and landed with a very different view of the airplane, especially when we had data to quantify. A big thank you to Rod and Eric for spending the day with me and letting me fly that airplane. Always a blast.